Here we go again, Maker Community. Another episode of your favorite podcast that doesn't give a shit about convention and tells it like it is. This is <laughs> Woodworking is Bullshit. I'm your host, Paul Jasper, scientist by day, woodworker by night, and I'm joined with my two fabulous, intriguing, and intelligent co-hosts, Eric Curtis, full-time furniture maker and content creator, and Mary Tassai. Uh, AI designer by day, contemporary woodworker by night. Woodworker Triss. Woodwork Triss? <laughs> Woodwork <there> Triss. <laughs> Have you been saying my last name to Sai this whole time? No, I've just been doing that to fuck we're with you. Gonna gla- we're going to glaze over Woodwork Triss? Like, that's not just some seductive title right there? I just thought it was cooler than Woodworker. <laughs> that should be my Instagram handle. Woodwork Triss? I'm, sure, I'm sure it's already out there. Go do it. Go claim it right now. It's like Dominatrix, but different. Uh, I also have to point out that you missed Eric's other title of uh, Bake Shop uh renovator oh, <laughs> shop renovator oh shit i don't know what you want to call it but tv personality eric tell everyone show. eric yes, tell everyone yes, i have a new show out uh where it is me and an old british lady named nancy burt whistle who is a fucking delight of a human being uh and we are renovating bakeries in la so by the time you hear this probably about half the season will be out on the CW, um, and you can see it Fridays at eight, prime time, baby. Or uh, you can see it, I believe, twelve hours after. It'll be streaming on the CW app, so you can check them out there. You can just go to cw.com and stream it there. Have you watched right. it? I have watched it, and uh, wow. it is it is a show. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Burt Whistle sounds like the most stereotypical British. You. Could Thing not be more British. You could not be more British than Nazi Bet Whistle. <laughs> I do love Great British Bake Off, so. We'll oh, yeah. And she, give it she a did. Watch. She won the Great British Bake Off uh, 10 years ago, the first season we had in the States. Was uh, it the first season? And it was the fir- not the first season, but the first season we got. It was season okay. four. Um, and yeah, she's, she is a delight of a human being. Uh, and it was the highlight of making the show was, was working with Nancy. Well, Eric, I know you like to give your credit away to everyone, but we're all very proud of you. Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, let's you get are, Emmy um, number two. I just yeah. <laughs> let's go two for two, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, not to draw the the conversation away from this, but I do <laughs> want to say that Woodwork Dress is not an account, and uh, I don't know if you remember, but your boy has a collection of accounts, <laughs> and so I oh, yeah. now have Woodwork Dress as Wait, one of my accounts. That? Woodwork, T R E S S. Excellent. Woodwork-tress. Anyone Woodwork-tress. who wants to see questionable <laughs> AI generated pictures of and if you think working. Exactly. <laughs> if you think that's not the after show today, it's just us generating images of Mary Woodworking. Wait, me? What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, you're you're the mascot, buddy. I don't yes. know how to tell you this. Oh, okay, God. this show's off to a roaring good start. <laughs> <laughs> it's like went straight to the bullshit. Oh, forget the woodworking. Let's yeah, just live yeah, in the that's bullshit the best today. Part. <laughs> okay. Well, we actually do have a serious show for today, as usual, and we what? like to start with a question. <laughs> oh my god! Ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, We're just in a loosey goosey mood. We really are. As usual, we will start with the question. I would like to point out also that we tried to record this last week and had technical issues, so instead we just played Mario Kart all night. That was fantastic. And then we were going to record last night, and then you were like, nah. I had to help a friend. Mm, Yeah, we're your friends too. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. And all our our listeners are friends, and you could help them by fucking recording once in a blue moon. Yeah. I do. Oh my god, it's this gang up! I did not expect. <laughs> you know All what? Right. You could help. You could help them by proposing the goddamn question for this week. <laughs> okay. All right. Enough. Uh, god, I guess we're just like teasing me this week. Apparently. All right. So, <laughs> question for this week is one that is uh, commonly asked. One of the most commonly asked questions that I get, and I'm sure a lot of 
um, my co-hosts also get. Indeed. So the question that we're going to be addressing is, is being, an ho- is being a hobbyist enough or should you go full time? Mm. So like we mentioned, this is commonly asked, especially for probably Polo and me, because we're both hobbyists and have full time jobs. Um, but I think it's particularly important to talk about because people have to make that decision of whether or not to make that jump from being a hobbyist into full time woodworking or full time whatever you want to become in this field. So there's a lot of uh, pros and cons of both, and we will go over them. And it kind of depends on, you know, like personal goals, financial situations, risk tolerances, passion. For me, I know, like, we'll, we'll go over this, but passion is something that I am worried about losing if it becomes my full-time job. So, um, yeah, it's uh, something that I often struggle with because I think it means that, you know, if it becomes a full-time job, I no longer have a hobby, which kind of scares me, but I know that's not always going to be the case for everyone. Um, yeah. So Paul or Eric, where, uh, I guess I first I'll ask Paul because you are also a yeah. hobbyist like me. Um, where do you land in this? Oh God. So, <laughs> all right. So I, I, for, first thing I want to do is speak from my own perspective, like how I feel. And then I want to sort of lo- raise some of the larger questions, Mary, that you touched on, which I think we should consider one at a time. So speaking for myself, I hear all the time from friends and family and all kinds of people for many years now, when are you going to pursue your real passion? of woodworking. Mm. When, when are you going to make the mm. switch? And what those people don't understand is that I am. you're not passionate about science? <laughs> is that I this am. This motherfucker <laughs> loves science so I goddamn I much. Yes, I do. <laughs> two things. I am I would die in a hill. It's just Paul of science and yes. Paul of design yes. and craft. <laughs> yep. Science <laughs> is my real like first passion. And it is, I mean, as much as I love woodworking, I'd say it's even stronger for science. And it mm. sustained me so, and I've never lost the love of it. Even though I do it as a job, I freaking love it. So um, I haven't lost it at all. And so I am pursuing my passion and woodworking has become an additional passion, which is lovely. I'm so thankful, but I am good not being a full-time woodworker. I love being a scientist and I love the flexibility it affords me in the wood shop. So that's my personal answer. So go ahead. Ask you Everyone wants to talk. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Just go ahead. Immediately. We both raised our hands. Uh, so I assume you plan on retiring one day. Yeah. Eh? I don't know. Eh? Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Right, wait, can, you, can, can I answer that? Wait, can I <laughs> yeah. answer that? Go, okay. please. So uh, to me, Science is not like a job I'm looking to get rid of. Science Mm -hmm. is like a way Mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. And I don't imagine like just retiring and never doing it again. I could see slowly downshifting like into more consulting or like a little Mm -hmm. less of a a fiery role or a demanding role. But it's a lifestyle. Like science is not a job. It's a lifestyle. So I don't think I'll ever per se retire. Go ahead. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to ask that is because that to me is an indicator that you can't not do something. And that's a good indication of whether or not you should pursue that as a career path. Now, we'll dive into that more for sure. But I was curious, like, do you see a future where you, you know, hang up your cleats, as it were? And then at that point, you say, Mm -mm. well, now I'm retired, but by definition, I'm semi-professional as a woodworker i don't know when i'm doing okay. science i love it and i can't imagine not doing it and when i'm doing woodworking i love it and i can't imagine not doing it and when i do one to the exclusion of the other it's really not good mm. like if all i do is science all the time i feel like something's missing and if all i do is woodworking all the time i hate it so for me that tells me a lot right there do not go full time into woodworking because when I'm in the shop and Mary, I'll let you say what you want to say so bad in just a sec. When I'm in the shop eight hours a day for like a a period of time, let's say there's a holiday or whatever. And I'm in the shop for long hours. I'm like, get me the fuck out of here. This is, Mm. I just three to four, three to four hours is like my max where I'm happiest after four hours, my happiness starts to decline in the shop. Hmm. Go ahead, Mary. Well, I was going to say, just because I relate so much to that statement, anytime anyone ever asks me, like my answer is so definitive. Absolutely not. I need the two to stay balanced as a 
person <laughs> mentally and <clears throat> physically, just everything about it. I need, I can't do one without the other and I don't want to do one without the other. So I like having, you know, my day job and I, you and I, Paul, are in unique situations where we actually are passionate about what we do for our jobs. That is not always the case for most people. Some people just work to get by, to get to their hobby. And I think that is the, the, that's the audience that this question might be more geared towards of like, when do I have the capabilities of making that switch? But for now, like you and I are very content in our current jobs. We're passionate about it. Um, I don't know if like UX design per se is not necessarily like my passion, but design in general is, and I like having different avenues of design thinking. So those are, those are probably my, you know, main answers whenever I get asked. Very, very well spoken, Mary. I love that answer. Um, I want to, I want to break it back to a series of questions now that will help someone in the audience listening sort of diagnose, you know, I hear all, Mary, you, you said this, I hear all the time, you know, should I go full time? What do you think? What should I do? You know, we, I hear that all the time on social media. And so I, we have a series of, of, of talking points. I think we'd like to move through and we'd like the reaction of Eric, who is the full timer in this crew. Right. And Mary and I, who are not. So Can I ask Eric a real a quick question. Sure. What What would you call yourself? Like a full time blank. Oh, I oof. um, full time small business owner because I think any small business owner does seven thousand fucking things, um, and you have to be a marketer. You have to be you know a producer of goods, of objects, of content, whatever it is. Um, so I think if I were it, the way that I identify is as a woodworker. That's that's my core identity. So I still want to think of myself as that more than anything. And everything else is just the, the kind of the business aspect of it. OK. OK, so the first question I feel like someone should ask themselves and um, Eric, you alluded to this issue is why do you want to go full time? Mm. Why do you want to do that? Is it because you think you can make more money? Is it because you think it'll be fun like your hobby is now? Or is it because it's a compulsion? You love doing that thing so much that that is literally the only career you can imagine yourself doing. <sighs> That's, I think that is the fundamental question and how you answer that question determines what you should do. I mean, if, if we're going to boil it down to its basic components, right? If you love doing this thing, if this is a thing that just brings you so much joy and you don't have the amount of experience, the hours of experience that, say, Paul does, where he recognizes at this point after years of doing it that after three to four hours in the shop, I get pretty burnt out and I'm pretty tired of it. Like that, that is valuable information. And I think what happens a lot of the time is we get so sucked into this thing that we just become obsessed with that we ignore all of the other things that are happening. We go, I want to do that. Also, whatever the thing is, you're, you're tired of your job. You're, you're, you know, not happy in your, your home life. You just have this distraction that you can focus on of this goal. And when we move toward goals, we're often happier than when we actually achieve the goal, right? So there's this illusion, this oasis of being a full-time woodworker that comes into play. But I think as I was kind of sitting with this question today, the, the only analogy that I could come up with was like that of a relationship. And there are some people who get into long-term relationships and they get married or they just stay long-term partners and if you ask them about their partner, they're like, yeah, they're, they're fine. They're okay. You know, they're there. And it's like, that's, I mean, I'm glad that you are in a relationship that you seem to be content <laughs> with, but also like you don't seem to be happy about it. Mm -hmm. And if you spend too much time around that person, you're like, can you just get the fuck out of my face? <laughs> like, can you just leave me the fuck? I got my own shit to do. Right. Uh, versus. There are those people out there that exist that are like, no, this, this is my human. This is my person. And there was never any doubt that this was going to be the relationship I was in. And no matter the ups and downs that come, they have that um, ability to be content and happy in that relationship. 
I think if that is the thing after years of, of pursuing woodworking that you come down on that you can't not do it. Compulsion, I think is the, the kind of operative word there. If you can't not do it, then, then it's the thing that you should do. So Eric, did you recognize that woodworking was your only, like the only path that would really make you happy? Yeah, I mean, I think there were other paths that I could be kind of content with that I could look at it and go, it is a job, it has meaning. And, you know, I can pay the bills with it. Um, I I don't think any of those jobs, I think of the three of us, I'm unique in that I didn't have a career path that led toward a kind of higher income. I think I, I had that that kind of blue collar glass ceiling, if we can mix metaphors there. Um, and I know that's dangerous. I know I saw those eyes, Paul. I know that was dangerous. <laughs> but like, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, right? There was a limit to the the realistic income that I was going to make. Um, and and so to me, there was never any question, like, if it's all going to be within that range, then I would rather go do this thing, than spend my life dreaming of doing it whilst doing something else. I would rather go chase this. Do you hit the wall like I do after three or four hours? Or is that like just the warm up? I can I can I can be in the shop for 12 hours and not think about it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I do it like regularly. There are times where like I'll be in the shop, whatever it is, I I could be just making a thing or it could be teaching. Like I'll go in at 630, 7 a.m. and then work till nine, teach nine to five and then stay in the shop till eight. And like, it's not, it's not a thing. It's not hard. Eric, that means you chose correctly to me. Right. Right. Because I used to be able to, I, you know, we used to have these, like in grad school, we used to have these sort of study groups about, we'd read papers and discuss Mm -hmm. the science of this or that. And hours would go by like minutes, three, four, five hours would go by. And I wasn't satiated. I wasn't tired. Mm -hmm. I wasn't satiated. Mm -hmm. It was like, it, it just, just, like you said, I can just do this almost endlessly. I forget to eat and mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't even matter. You don't even give a shit, right? Yeah. So that is such a good sign that that is like something that occupies your mind in such a glorious state of flow that you can do that mm-hmm. thing for so many hours. I feel like you chose very wisely. And you also brought up the next topic, which I think is the economics of it. You were talking about if I, you know, how much will I make? So can we talk, you know, if someone's thinking about making this change, there's the economics of it should be considered from the starting economics, Eric, which you brought up. What what does that mean to start a new business and the sustainability economics? Well, before before we touch that, I just kind of want to close the, sure. the sentence from before the paragraph. Um, so if it is not a thing that you are not the, you don't have a compulsion to do. Like if you can do something else, you should do that because the woodworking that we're talking about is essentially being an independent artist. That's not running a woodworking business. Those are two separate things. Running a production business and being an artist are two separate things. So if you can do anything else, go do that. Cause it's fucking hard to do this full time. If well, you want to well, have a business mind, Go ahead. That the 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 fact that this is hard as a full time is our fourth topic. So we're going to okay, cover so that. We'll, we'll get in, that. Yeah, we'll get that. we're going to cover that. But if you do have a business mind and you're interested in growing business, I think there is opportunity there. That's not how my mind works, and I don't think that's how your minds work. So mm-hmm. I, I want to clarify that that's where we're coming from. We're not coming from a business in woodworking standpoint. Uh, also, that said, like there are also different definitions of. Full-time yeah, there are. Ahead. Can you define it for I me? Did, I didn't mean that <laughs> question, but I mean, there are different kinds of full-time careers within this market. So, yeah. oh my God, you yeah. guys. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, like, but are that's you going to be a furniture point. maker or a teacher or a content creator or, or, like a, or a designer company. in a furniture shop? Yeah, you exactly. Know? Like there's so absolutely. being able to identify your strengths and identify if you want to make that switch into that field is 
yeah. essential. And that's the, our sixth topic is the different paths you could take. So, okay. All right. We'll you know, get there. We, we'll we get have there. Like okay. a, a really nice roadmap in front of us. So topic so the two, economics, the economics, the economics. So starting <laughs> and sustaining as a full time. So the path that I took, which is by no means the only path, but I do think that it is the safest path was that I had a full time job for a number of years as I was trying to figure it out. And that job shifted, right? Like I was a gymnastics coach. I was a a wood shop teacher. I worked in cabinet shops. I was everything. And I always had my business going on in the background. I always made sure that I had a place to work. Now, that place was not always glorious. For a number of years, I was working in an unheated one car garage with no windows. And in the winter, I would turn a propane heater on until I could not breathe and then opened up the garage door. Oh my gosh. I did not say <laughs> it was a healthy choice, but it was the that choice that terrible. needed to be made. Eric. Oh, yeah, no, I took I took at least two years off my life. That's fine. Um, but but no the point is heaters? this. Like what? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's bad. Yeah. I literally just took the oxygen out of the uh. room and then opened up the door to let it back in. <laughs> It makes but it hey. easier to get through the day. <laughs> yeah, you know, you just get a little high, it's fine. Uh, so, uh, but but what that allowed me to do was to slowly develop my skill set over a number of years and to slowly build up the equipment that I was uh, um, taking on, right? I would do trades with people to get new equipment, uh, you know, and, and by the time I moved into this shop after whatever it was, eight, nine years of doing that, then I had enough equipment to start a shop and I didn't have to go into debt to open a business, which is a thing that so many people do coming out of school. They come out and they go, oh my God, I want to be a woodworker. And then they drop 30 grand on equipment. And then for the next however many months or years, they're busy paying that off instead of having an income. All right. So you mentioned 30 grand on equipment. How much does it cost to get a basic wood shop started with like your basic machines. I get this question all the time. What's your shop worth? How much money do you have in your shop? Depends on the the level of equipment you're going for. Like if you're if you're going contractor grade, you can probably do it for five grand. Okay. If and you, what if you're doing if, pro prosumer? If you're if you're doing legitimate equipment, I mean, I would I would struggle to put it below thirty to forty grand realistically and that's for that's for basics that's not for luxury shit that is just table saw joiner planer dust collection uh maybe some kind of repetitive machine like a shaper origin or or a a low grade cnc or a laser cut or something like Mm -hmm. that like you're kind of basic eight to ten pieces of equipment Mm -hmm. i mean you're talking you're talking 40 grand mary how much have you put into your shop (laughs) Uh, I'm in a very fortunate situation in which (laughs) my shop mate is a full-time woodworker. So she has brought most of her equipment and she's bought most of the equipment. I've brought in something. So I have a lot of like the smaller tools and a lot of like the festival things. Um, I bought like the bandsaw and, you know, storage organization. So I cannot speak to that because I am basically (sighs) taking advantage of her. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that makes it sound negative. It was agreed upon. You know? It was agreed like, upon, was, yes. <laughs> you're not manipulating the situation. No, no, no. We're, we both knew exactly what we were bringing to the table when we co- when we came into this yeah. agreement of we're going to be in the wood shop together. We both were desperate to have our own space and we trust each other as yeah. uh, people working in wood shops. I think that was the biggest thing. We were just so, so tired of being in spaces where you couldn't trust the machines anymore. You couldn't make Mm -hmm. like, you know, things were just left everywhere and just, it was a nightmare. So we both knew that coming in. And we also know that if one of us moves out, then the other person, if my shop moves out, I'm not going to have much of a wood shop left. So (laughs) I understand (laughs) that I might need to figure something out then. If I leave, then she'll be missing certain things too, but not as much. So yeah. Yeah, I would estimate my shop's probably worth twenty to thirty k of 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 equipment. I bought almost all of it used. I highly mm. recommend buying used machines. One hundred percent. All machines have idiosyncrasies. Even new ones have mm-hmm. some idiosyncrasies. And the sooner you learn your machines, the better you can just kind of get a feel for what their peculiarities are. And it doesn't matter if they're new or used. I got a twelve 
I, I remember I got a 12, like my joiner, for example, it's a 12 inch joiner, helical head, grizzly, huge in feet and out feet table, 1300 bucks used from a cabinet shop who was, Oh, out. wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All day. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. And, and is it perfect? Absolutely not. The beds are at max and they're not quite coplanar all the time, but they're coplanar enough that I can get away with it. Like, so yep. yeah, there's going to be some, some <laughs> idiosyncrasies <laughs> but with every the, that's machine. That's the case, like you said, with new machines as well. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. And so, some older ones that are better quality anyway, like some of the, yeah, it the is. newer ones are just not built it to is. the same standard. Yep. So for those who don't mind uh, understanding their machines and working through their idiosyncrasies, like any good relationship, uh, I recommend you, <laughs> I recommend you uh, buying used. You'll get a lot more for your money. And the second uh, cost is is wood. I actually mm. have, I would say, five to eight thousand dollars worth of wood that I bought. I'm probably somewhere in that same range. Yeah. Oh my god, I cannot relate to that. But well. Hmm. No, I mean, I also, <laughs> in fairness, I have 12, 14 years of material yes. that I've essentially <laughs> been collecting. And then what I'm always intentional about doing, this is how that happens, right? Because you don't just go, oh, great, I've got an extra eight grand lying around. You know what I should do? <laughs> should make a run to Hearn. No, um, it's a little bit out of time. Right. And so yeah. every project, number yeah. one, when you're pricing out a project for materials, you always count in 10 to 20% dead. Right. So you just build that in. And then hopefully sometimes you get a little bit extra. But also what happens is sometimes you see the right piece of material, like you get a flitch, you get a handful of pieces of material that works for the project, but then you end up using 50 percent of it. So you build it up that way over the years. And then when stuff runs out, you replace it. And then next thing you know, you've got a large collection. Yeah, I could easily see uh that happening. I'm, I'm realizing now that I'm not in that situation because I was always in a shared shop mm -hmm. where I had to pay for storage. And yep. if I yep. had any scrap pieces, I was like, Oh no, I can't, I can't like leave this here. It's going to cost me yep. money. So I always tried to like burn through it or, uh, you know, sell it or give it away. So that, that's about the, the starting costs. How about the running and sustaining costs? Eric, can you give me an example of like a new woodworker who goes full time and he was making a product, right? What do you think the first few years are going to look like in terms of income? Typically, I know it's. I know there's a huge variability, but can you give, there, yeah, give me a ballpark? A ma massive variability um, as far as the income to the business versus like, the the like individual. How, yeah, the individual. Like, how much do you think an individual would make their first few years? Um, typically, sub sub ten to twenty. Wow, that, that little. Oh, I thought it was more guess. than that. No, okay. no. Uh, well, I, and again, this is coming from uh, a small business, like one to two person shop. In this case, if they're starting out one person shop, like you don't come out of the gate. There's, I should say, there's very, very few people who come out of the gate hot and become desirable names off the jump. Like that's mm -hmm. like Derek Jeter coming up through the minors in 96. Like it just, that's a rare thing that happens. Nobody. But what if they've that. already established themselves as a hobbyist? Well, and that that's the difference. World. And so, so that is the difference. This is what I mean by the, the advantage that I had was having that full-time job and building up a client base while I was doing that. I think the first year that, um, I went full-time again, I think I did 50. I want to yeah. say, Eric, um, yeah, I think that's a, I think with an established clientele as a first year, like that's established, right? You already but did that, the... but that was five years in the making though. Right? Yeah. So that's yeah, not, yeah, that's not yeah. coming out of school or just like deciding one day I'm going to quit my job and be a woodworker. Yeah. That's building up clients and business relationships in the content world and all of those things and some respectability to the point where I could come out and do 50. And let me tell you guys, that was the biggest hustle of my life like that wow. that was 50 that i fucking scrapped for wow uh so like it's not it, it takes a long time yeah. to set up a, a business flow it doesn't come easy now mary no. you and i have the economics of a, a tech or a science degree uh 
to bounce against that reality of say, you know, oh, Paul, when you can go full time, Mary, when you can go full time. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like to, for, for, if you take those economics versus a design degree like you have at you know, Adobe or or I have in science. I mean, the economics of those types of degrees are very, very different animals. Oh, yeah. The, the amount of times that Eric makes fun of me for liking to be in uh, a bougie a nice bitch. Restaurant. <laughs> There is no mm-hmm. way I could support my lifestyle being a full-time woodworker. I would, I, I like making money, and I went to school for so long <laughs> for it. So I do not want to get rid of that. <laughs> now I know talking about money is taboo, but as I said, this is a podcast that doesn't give a shit about convention. And well, so in, you know, we talk about- also in fairness. I don't mean to cut you off, but in fairness, one of the most valuable things about the maker community is that we're very open about money. And that makes everybody feel more at ease and, you know, nobody's trying yeah. to hide shit. Uh, so, so the, absolutely, Eric, uh, that's, and I think that's brilliant. Uh, the point Mary and I as hobbyists are, are, are t- speaking to is you have a choice of two things you love. <laughs> One of which <laughs> has a much more uh, attainable, like income or, or is, is much more, uh, how do you say this? Gosh, I, I'm, I'm struggling for the words. One one pays better than the other. Let's just, you yeah. know, yeah. one pays better than the other, uh, quite frankly, typically, and not in every case, right? So, you know, you love these two things. It, you know, I think you owe it to yourself to think about the economics of the two things you love and what does it make sense to do full-time and what does it make sense to do as a hobby? And, and so I think for, for me and Mary, that decision was fairly easy for the two of us. I think the advantage that you two have, I've sat with this for a number of years and the, the, the conclusion that I've come to, and please push back on me if you think that I'm wrong or if you have differing opinions on this, the economics of any situation typically works out that the people who think get paid more than the people who do. I think that's just generally how it works. I hate that. And, but, but. That doesn't mean that the people who do can't be great thinkers. So what happens is your professions are typically seen as thinking professions, whereas my profession is seen as a doing profession. I I hate that, but I can't say that the data doesn't support what you're saying. Right, Mm -hmm. right. But how many people do both of you work with who don't have any fucking original ideas who just do the thing that you tell them to do? And I bet in your social hierarchy, nobody takes them very seriously. They just get paid kind of the economic wage, uh, you know, the standard of where it exists. Can Whereas you- in, in my world, the people who can take what they're doing and think and apply it differently, it doesn't matter what you're building, right? You could be building furniture, you could be making art, you could be building houses. The people who are really good at problem solving and creating new solutions do end up typically making a good living. Do you know what I hate about it? No, you're right. Uh, Eric, I, I, that is my experience too. What I hate about that is the doing is so hard also. Mm-hmm. Like the thinking is, it, it can be difficult at t- you know, I guess I, I gravitate more towards that part, but the, 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 the doing, the physicality of, and the, the sheer exhaustion and perseverance is so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's to think that that's not valued as much because I do both. Like I, I do you know, like let's, let's, I I hate these terms, but like we're thinking during the day. I hate, I just, I don't know. It makes Mm. me skin crawl. I hate to say that because as we're woodworking, we're thinking too, but yes, the, the sort of ivory tower you're thinking during the day and then at night you're woodworking and they're both equally taxing. They're equally exhausting for different reasons, but for some reason they seem to be valued differently now. All right. So can, can we stick a pin in this? Cause I feel like, okay. this, all right. This Cause is like, this, this is a good this, conversation, yeah. but, but we're going to go <laughs> off down some fucking rabbit holes right okay. now. Okay. Okay. So the third piece, like, I, I want to stick a pin in the, in the, in the economics because like, yeah, I, I think there's a whole episode here. I uh, hope everyone's not all hot and bothered to keep going. <laughs> um, is it okay to have a job and be a hobbyist? I feel like there's some inertia that says mm, you're less if you're a hobbyist. You're not that serious. Is there a fight in words? <laughs> I Paul, mean, Paul I... likes to piss people off. <laughs> I feel very strongly about like hobbies being important to 
who you are as a person. Like for me, that's how I, I don't know. That's why I think rounds me out. I, I very much enjoy keeping woodworking as a hobby. Um, well, I guess my question for you, Paul, is like, what makes you ask that question? What's the argument behind it? I feel like there's some inertia that the word hobby has this, this attachment to it that it's mm. like, it's not that serious. You're not that well, serious I, about it. I think serious is a critical word there because I'm, I'm wondering about the history of the word hobby, right? Like the entomology, etymology, <laughs> etymology, not entomology. <laughs> entomology is the study of bugs, is it not? Bugs, That's yep. right. Uh, <laughs> the etymology of it. Uh, so the, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about like the gentleman saw, right? The gent saw. So I think the word hobby came about after this, the invention of leisure, right? Like the, the working the nine to five job and you have spare time. And that then implies that you have income and time to spend on a hobby. And therefore, by definition, you're not taking it very seriously because it's a leisurely activity. I have the etymology. If you okay, go it. on, please tell me, the, <laughs> tell me, the, tell me the entomology. <laughs> if you in could the define hobby right? for me, please. <laughs> was Eric <Arab> right? <laughs> in the 13th century, the word hobby referred to a small horse or a pony. It later came what? to describe, <laughs> yeah, it later came to describe a toy horse or a hobby horse. It's mm. from the hobby horse that the word's modern sense of favorite pastime evolve. A hobby is something that you do for fun, not money. And you typically do it fairly regularly. So Wait, I, I don't. Under, how does it relate to the horse? Part? Hobby horse. A hobby it horse. A, a hobby horse, and then it turned into a hobby. Like a, a hobby, hobby horse, horse is, is a like shitty a, tiny horse. Yeah. Like. <laughs> okay. The one time we it's, it's actually gave horse. her a definition, and she's oh confused. God. Yeah. And for those that don't know, Mary asked for us to define shit every goddamn episode. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, anyway. I like being clear. <laughs> okay, being clear. Back on topic then. Uh, so the, the, the issue is, I think a lot of people, there's this inertia or this, this, this feeling that if you say, I'm a hobbyist, you're not good and you're not serious. And mm -hmm. I don't know that that's the case. It's, you can be a hobbyist and you can be very serious and you can be quite good. And it, it, the, I feel like it shouldn't be a bad word like it is. I agree with you. It shouldn't be a bad word because some of the best woodworkers I know are hobbyists. I wonder how much of that kind of snootiness is linked to our innate Western capitalistic intentions of if you are good, you should do it for profit. It should mm -hmm. drive you to grow versus just being good for good sake. Because if you're if you are a hobbyist who then makes money doing it, you're still a hobbyist, but almost every single person to a T, and I was just as guilty of this as anybody else, says, well, I'm a semi-professional, right? Like there's, mm. there is a hierarchy of if I'm good enough to make money, then I'm no longer a hobbyist. Hobbyist oh. has that, that, in, that mm. you know, that mm. there's something about it that says like, ah, I'm just learning. I could see that. I mean, I feel like I wonder if that uh, meaning for hobbyist is also maybe an older way of thinking because these days you can back up your work so easily by showing, you know, like your Instagram or your portfolio or whatever, even if you're a hobbyist, like, Oh yeah, no, I'm good because you can like, I, I can prove it real quick to you. Like, I, I don't know. I just don't know if people think that way anymore. Well, also can I, <laughs> can I risk being a dick real quick? Oh, okay. I mean, of course. On this I mean, podcast, Eric, 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 on this podcast? There is. I feel like that's every podcast for you. I mean, that's how I live my life. Uh, there, is, there is no telltale sign more clear that a person is seeking validation in their work than when they take their phone out and they say, okay, let me fair, show you yes. an image of it, you know? Because it is a thing that says, like, I don't believe that I am considered like a, a mm. amateur, a seasoned hobbyist, whatever. So I need to then prove it versus at some point, And I think we all get to this point over years and projects where we just go, yeah, no, I make shit. Like it's, I don't give a shit if you believe me. Like I, I still make shit. <laughs> okay. I should clarify <laughs> it. Not coming from you, I guess, but 
your work is so easily you can your work can be looked like researched upon from other people who want to know your work and they may not realize that you're a hobbyist so they might be like oh yeah i know like hopper pick stuff and and not even realize that paul is not a full-time woodworker i feel like that is so much easier for people to look up these days than having to like rely by rely on like i don't know word of i don't know just hearing it from other people it's fair um well Eric, because you're being a dick, I would like to, to give a <laughs> counterpoint, <laughs> which okay. is I, just, I, I give a talk recently on design at uh, North Bennett Street School and, and Lexington Arts Council in, in Lexington, Mass. Humble and, brag. No, no, <laughs> bitch. No, no, no. no. I just wanted I'm to very say proud where, of you, buddy. I no, just wanted to I just shit wanted on to you. mention where I was giving the talk, <laughs> dick. Um, <laughs> but what I did at the talk is I started it by encouraging people to show each other their Instagrams. Stop being mm. so goddamn like, oh, I'm too cool for school. You, you know, I don't have to show you anything. I'm like, let's be vulnerable. Let's show each other what we're working on. Let's talk about collaborating. Let's show each other our work and talk about designs. So actually, I go the opposite way. I encourage them to take out their phones and show each other what they're working on because that is the genesis of collaborations and talking about stuff. That's a fair counterpoint. And I Thank think you. there is, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be an asshole. It was just a funny thing that popped <laughs> into my head because, because it is, so it seems <laughs> it's so naturally, you know, okay. grew up in an okay. Italian New York household. What do you okay. want? Okay. Um, so next topic, next topic. So <laughs> <laughs> hobbyist is not a bad word, right? Okay. It so is the not. next topic is, so let's say you do want to go full time. Full time is hard. Let's talk about that. Let's start by all the reasons that being full time is difficult and a challenge. And like, let not not to dissuade you from going full time, but let's talk about the, some of the challenges. Number one, creativity on demand. Like that's tough, mm -hmm. right? Eric, you you spoke recently how you know you've been so under the gun, the burnout, the pressure of producing all the time, producing videos, producing pieces, creativity on demand is very draining. It is draining. Um, and there are times where you just have to get it done and it becomes a muscle memory thing. It's like doing any, like I'm sure you can science without thinking. Okay. That's a thing. Well, <laughs> no, no, you just get good this. at the thing, you know, right? Yeah. yeah, you get good at the thing. And like you can, Mary, I'm sure you can lay out a web page on demand. Sure. That's a thing that you do, right? <laughs> Mary's not a web designer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the fuck she does. She just says I'm, I UX all the time. I'm like, what's that, a UTI? I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. So, <laughs> so there, you, you develop these skill sets that you can rely on. But what ends up happening is if you want to continue to push yourself and grow, then you end up um, frustrated in, in kind of the loop of, a client wants it by this date and here's yeah. how I know to resolve that problem. So I'm going to resolve it in a very similar way. And Eric, you talked about that. You're like, I know, like I relied on my typical book of tricks mm -hmm. that I know pleases people, but it's not mm -hmm. challenging me. So like there's yeah. that, there's that personal fulfillment versus like just satisfying the customer to get the job done on time. Right. Uh, yeah. Another, another ep ep uh, is another issue is the repetition <laughs> Of it, sorry, I had some whiskey. <laughs> really, uh, really struggled on that one. I did. How I many did. drinks I had, have we had here? <laughs> uh, two huge glasses of whiskey. Another, uh, another, another issue is repetition. Does repetition steal your creative spark? Mm -hmm. For me, it does. But for some people, and I know we've touched on this in the past. For some people, they thrive under repetition. Like some people yeah. are repetition artists, and they do their best work. Yeah. Kind of tweaking things here and there and developing through iteration and that's okay yeah. like they're, they're they're one is not better than the other yeah yeah that's and true. also production people who do production that's so much repetition but at that mm -hmm. point it's just a level that you're used to and that's all you want to do yeah i think of bowl turners for some reason they seem always to be like production 
uh, yep. mm-hmm. these is production mindset. Although I, I do want to recall, and I know I mentioned this in a previous episode, and, and Eric, you said this, that sometimes like design ideas come through that repetition when your mind yeah. is not completely occupied, you've done it a thousand times. So you have a little brain, bit of brain waves open to like think about your next design idea. Um, I believe you said those thoughts come when you're washing your ball sack. If I that's remember exa- correctly, yes, yes. In fact, <laughs> dear God. In fact, in fact, I I did not use any of those words. You prick. I think he said uh, in the shower. I, I I'm pretty shower. sure he said when you're washing your sack. I did not say wash. I said washing your <laughs> junk. Oh my okay, god! Okay, <laughs> all right. Six and one half dozen okay. the other. Okay. Next is the idea of hustle and burnout, Eric. You've spoken to that recently because yep. you're, you're so in. You've put so much into this business, and you just don't want it to fail. So you're willing to hustle, burn out. You work too much, um, and I think well, we know that working too much, Mary, is related <laughs> to our happiness. <laughs> What? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm always happy and never work too much ever in my life. <laughs> That's the kind of honest truth you come to this podcast for right there. I think I think in unsung or or not off discussed, I should say, uh, part of that is um, money insecurity, mm. right? So when you have a job, you go to that job presumably 40 hours a week or in Mary's case, 107 hours a week. (laughs) And you, you know, you're either salaried or you're going to get overtime. Like what, you know that your paycheck is going to clear, right? And you know what you're going to get paid roughly Mm -hmm. when you run a business, you know what you're going to get paid for the next couple of weeks. And then after that, like you just, you have that thing for me, particularly who didn't come from money. And I think most people, who are running a small business have some some iteration of this you have this thing of just like well what if i don't get the next job and then then you hustle and then you take on more than you can chew and then next thing you know you're buried under work and you burn out and so it's it's a really hard thing to accept the hope that you have done enough to have your business run and not overbook yourself. Cause I think that like for me specifically, that's where my burnout always comes from is I just go, yeah, I have to say yes, because what if nobody else calls me up and what if it all just fucking stops Mm -hmm. after that one? And then next thing you know, I've got six months to make four projects plus all of these contracts for content. And I'm like, I can't fucking do it all. I just, I can't. At what point would it, (laughs) at what point now, like how long would you have to have not worked or produced content for you to have to take another like Pottery Barn job? (laughs) Pottery (laughs) Barn? Um, Did you work at Pottery Barn? I did not. You did a replica, right? You did like a replica of a Pottery Barn table. All right, all right, all right, all right. That's fair. That's fair. I was like, did I work at Pottery Barn? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Do I know you better? (laughs) (laughs) You might. Um... It, so I have about six to eight months um, that I could live off of. Uh, so and that's 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 very good for for what I'm doing. Like, I'm very happy with that. And there's no indication that anything would slow to that point. Um, and I know that I could I'm marketable enough to be able to find a job in that time if that were to happen, um, which I think now I'm finally realizing, OK, I need to stop hustling so goddamn much and Mm -hmm. figure out in what direction do I want to take the momentum of the business for the long term. You were doing too much, big guy. You were burnt out. I was doing too much. I was. I could tell. Throw on another TV show. It's fine. (laughs) You know, like sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta wait till the CW calls, you know? So, (laughs) so actually we're dancing around our last topic, which is, what are the different paths to full time? You know, you're talking about Eric does shows. Well, Eric, wait, co- time out, time out. Time out. <laughs> Eric does a lot. <laughs> Eric, Eric is not a typical example. That is I, very I true. Yes, Eric is. is that's that's ins- fair. Eric, just shut up for a minute. <laughs> Eric is insanely talented. He's like, and I've said this to him many times face to face. He's capable. He does so many things so well. He can do the. He can do the carpenter. He can do the fine trim guy. He can do the art, you know, one of a kind guy. He can be the life of the party. He can fade to the background. He can 
do the show. He can be the content creator. Like Eric is extremely versatile. One of the most versatile humans I know, certainly in the woodworking space, without a doubt. So Eric has, to, to me, a plethora of, of opportunities at his fingertips due to his natural aptitudes and eric you're just going to shut up and listen to me praise you <laughs> okay so with that speaking though what you know what are the many different paths one can take towards woodworking so obviously the first one that i'll, I'll throw out there is like i like to make furniture i want commissions and i just want to make furniture now i only know a few people who can make a living at that and just purely yeah. that i was gonna say i've talked to keith about this and his answer is always the same it's always like you got to do something else on the side. Otherwise you're really going to struggle. Like these days it is so hard to solely be a furniture maker. Like you can do teaching on the side or condecoration or something else. Like it is so hard. I don't think it's just these days. I think it's always been that way. I think now, now this is, this is me because we always look back on the end of the careers of the people who came before us. And we think of the Nakashimas, the Maloofs, the, the Krenovs, et cetera, et cetera. But Nakashima for 50 fucking years was hustling as a farmer, as a carpenter. He was an architect. He didn't just do furniture. And it was mm-hmm. the same with Maloof. He was out there doing a hundred things until at some point late in his career, his rocking chair became well-known enough to carry his business. Good point. And so I think it's always been, and even now, the people that we look back on 20 years ago who were doing this, they were writing for fine woodworking. They were teaching in schools and mm. that's how they became known as furniture makers. Mm. So I don't think there's ever been a path to being a furniture maker exclusively if you don't want to live under the poverty line. I just don't so, think that that, that so, exists. No, that's a great point. Excellent. And and backed up by a lot of evidence uh, from other famous uh, you know, woodworkers and their careers. What are some of the other things you can do to supplement? Obviously teaching is teaching a is a huge one, one right? Te- because every, there's always, there's always people hungry to learn, right? Mm-hmm. Every single full-time woodworker that I know, I shouldn't say that 95% of the full-time woodworkers that I know are also teachers, whether it's once or twice a year, or a lot of them who are known as furniture makers essentially travel and teach full time at this point, mm-hmm. and they just make a couple of commissions a year. So mm-hmm. that is a vi- and there's a lot of craft schools out there. And once you get into the craft school circuit, like you can, I'll just take Farazudi as an example because he's a buddy of mine, and I talk about him often enough. I mean, he goes from College of the Redwoods. Uh, Mark Adams, CFC, Florida School of Woodworking, uh, Rose Rosewood, whatever the one in Toronto is like, he just basically circles five to eight craft schools and then makes things in between and teaches it all of them once to twice a year. So if you're if you're doing eight craft schools twice a year, some of them are one week, some of them are two weeks. That's three quarters of the year already. Mm. You know, like it's just that's how you sustain yourself. So uh, there's two types of teaching, I think. So for the full timers, they're doing as a source of income for the hobbyists. At least I'm going to speak from my point of view. I teach not for the income. The income is it's it's great and all that's fine, but I I don't need the income. I have a full time job. I do it because I feel strongly that if we do, if we who have been in the field, at least like I, you know, I'm in the field 20 years now, if I don't start to give back, even though I don't feel qualified to give back sometimes, like I don't feel like a master of anything, to be honest. But look, if we don't start giving back, who's going to, like, we're the ones who are supposed to start giving back. So like I do, at, I do at least you know, one teaching or one like presentation or whatever from time to time, because I feel like the field has given me so much. I Mm. need to return it to the field because it is part of just keeping the whole thing healthy. So I think even full-time people have their reasons for teaching, even hobbyists, I think can have their reasons for teaching. And I, I will go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Teaching is not the most Like I do teach for the money. Like I have to, I got to pay bills. I could make more money not teaching, but I like I teaching is, it brings me so much joy that it's worth taking the pay cut to go teach 
than to make content or commissions because it's just like I took a week and a half off. I was in Vermont and then I was in Maine and then I went and did some camping and I came back and I was talking to, to my girlfriend on the phone the other day. She's like, you just seem lighter. Like I just I teaching is so much fucking fun to get to spend time with people who are striving to learn because for what it does for me is it reminds me of where I was 10, 12 years ago. Right. Yes. And it, it ignites that there, you will never get that same amount of joy from making the first piece that you ever made ever again. And the way that you get that is by experiencing it with other people who yes, make that first piece for the it, first time. It, like passion by proxy, right? Yes. You're, you're, you feel it through them. Yeah. So that's great, Eric. And I'm, I'm, I think it's awesome you do that. And it actually speaks to the concept of enough. Do you have enough money to have mm. a d- good life? Then stop pr- to prioritizing solely money and prioritize mm-hmm. things that bring you joy in addition to money. It might not be as much money as you might have made otherwise, but joy is an important component of living a well-rounded life. I think that's really what you're hundred percent. And I, 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 I respect that and I admire that in you. Um, last, last issue about the different paths. So we've talked about teaching and full time. What about social media and content creation as a new path? <laughs> um, it is, if you can do it thoughtfully, and if you can get lucky, it mm. is the most lucrative path, mm. at least at this moment. I don't know how long that will last. It could be the new television. All of the data is pointing to the fact that it is the new television, so it could be around for a long while, or it could be a bubble. I have no idea. But if you can figure out a way, the best advice that I ever got was from Annie early on in my career, Anne of all trades, who we've been friends for forever. Um, and she told me, get over yourself and start posting on Instagram. This was in like 2018. And it really was like, to your point earlier, Paul, like it was like a, like a pride thing. It was like, a, well, I don't, uh, it's social media. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And then Were there many other woodworkers on Instagram at that point or no? Um, yeah, I mean, the OGs, pretty late. the, yeah, the OGs were, were definitely on there. There were a lot of large accounts, um, I think there were, you know, like if you had over a hundred thousand on Instagram at that point, you were a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, if you can figure out, it's another business venture, and if you can figure out how to work that into your business plan, then what it does allow you to do is make interesting objects and maintain creative autonomy and creative engagement in a way that some other paths wouldn't necessarily allow you to do. Well said. All right. Yeah, and I know, like, uh, I guess in the past, well, for YouTube channels, they've said like, oh, it's the life of the average YouTube channel is like seven years. But at this point, I feel like I know of so many channels now that have outlasted that, and I feel like social media and especially YouTube specifically is only getting stronger right now. So mm-hmm. that saying may not be true. I I don't know that it is true anymore. Um, and I mean, we also got to remember we are still in the the first stage of YouTube. Like, you know, you can break down overall, but I listen, YouTube is here to stay. All the other platforms are going to come and go. YouTube is here to stay. So I think we are still very much in the first stage, maybe, maybe in the early stages of the second phase of YouTube. Um, And I don't think there is any indication that you can't make a channel that lasts 10 to 20 years like you you could be the 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 bob ross or the um mr rogers of woodworking if you wanted to be i love bob ross who doesn't love bob ross <laughs> who 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 Just didn't happy little smoke trees. <laughs> who didn't smoke a J and fall asleep to bob ross in college come on uh, <laughs> you know anytime speak yeah anytime my daughter is sick and home from school I put Aww. on, I, I, she asked me to put on Bob Ross. And yeah. She really? Lays, yeah, she lays on the couch and she's only a teenager. It's the pro move. It's and she lays move. on the couch and she listens to those like soothing words of Bob Ross as she like falls in and out of sleep. <laughs> That's so cute. Oh, my it's God. amazing. My equivalent of that is National Geographic. Always just okay. doing okay. National Geographic or like Planet Earth or BBC anything. Oh, so good. Happy little discussions we just had. I hope (laughs) one day 
that somebody compares me to Roy Underhill. That's my career goal. If I can make that happen, <gasps> then I will have made it. We have to get Roy Underhill on the podcast. Let's ask Roy. Him. Roy is one of the best human beings I've ever met. All right. So Roy Underhill, <laughs> Bob Ross. Well, we can't have Bob Ross. But anyway, let's wrap up uh, our discussion about going full time. I think we covered a lot of topics. Why do you want ask yourself? Why do you want to do it? Is it so burning hot that it's a compulsion? There's no other thing you can do. All right, go do it. Eric says, unless unless it feels that strong, don't do it. <laughs> That's where I stand. That's where I come down. The second point is consider the economics of it, both the startup economics, uh, how to make that work and the sustainability economics. Number three, you know, if you choose not to go full time, hobbyist is not a bad word. There's plenty of mm. really happy, talented hobbyists out there. And let, let's get let's dispel this this inertia or the, the this the stigma around being a hobbyist. Number four, if you do decide to do it, know it's going to be a hard path. And we talked a lot about all the reasons it was going to be a hard path. And finally, if you do do it, know that there are many different routes to do it, whether it's content creation or commissions or teaching or some culmination of income streams, right? And so, I, you know, there's no clear answer. The answer is going to come from you and your objectives and what you, what you love to do. So with that, we're going to pivot to our next segment. And I'm going to give, um, I'm going to give our two co-hosts who are, <laughs> who are typing really nasty things to me in the chat uh, privately. Um, I'm going to give them a choice of what we pivot to. Is our next segment either sourcing wood, you fuckers, stop typing stuff. Is it sourcing wood or is it wood trivia? Like, where do you buy your wood or do we want to do wood trivia? You guys pick. <laughs> We're too distracted. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're too busy fucking typing bullshit like to me. <laughs> Nobody fucking doo doo ducky. <laughs> Second grade, third grade humor over here. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> are, are we gonna do? Uh, are we gonna do trivia or I, where to buy wood? Mm, Let's I would go. Say, oh, I was gonna say probably trivia, and then we could do. I was gonna say trivia buy wood as well. in, in the after show. Okay, after show is where do you source your wood from? All right, so we'll get to that. So trivia. All right, because you know I got a lot of feedback from our last trivia that they people enjoyed it. So I instead of using internet trivia like Eric did very lazily, wow. I actually okay. wrote the trivia. <laughs> <laughs> I took the time, Eric, you little bitch, to write the trivia questions myself. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to bring some fresh fucking segs into this show. No, actually, <laughs> actually, actually, I liked his question. Actually, I, I thought the trivia was amazing, and Jen said Aloha Wood, which people want me to Aloha into a Wood. I'm I'm yeah. making a T-shirt on Bonfire right now. Aloha okay. Wood. <laughs> there are a few people who said they would buy that immediately. <laughs> All right, 100. are you ready for some trivia? Love it. Yes. All right, let's do it. Okay. So first off, I don't know why I thought about this, but I did. What are the best woods? Yes. To use for outdoor applications. How many Mary, options do we have? Mar uh, yeah. you can you can give uh, up to the list? Yeah, you can give up to four answers. Mary, what would cedar? you use for outdoor furniture? Cedar. Eric, your turn. You go one at a time. Eric, what's Ipe. yours? Ipe, excellent. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I know another Mary. one, but I took that one because you wanted that one. I've used Sapelli before. Hmm. I, 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 I mean, I don't know. It's a mahogany <laughs> relative, but yeah, it might be okay because mahogany is considered pretty good. I, I know of Sapelli holding up over many years, so that's the okay. reason I say so, it. Okay, so I, I buy that. I buy that. Eric? Uh, locust, either honey or black. Oh, that is such a dark horse answer. <laughs> I love that answer. That's not it's one right. Of That's why it's right. It's right. And by the way, black locust apparently the bark is like toxic. It's got a human yeah. toxin in black. Them. Black locust. I have pulled up uh, fence posts, like farm posts of black locust, hmm. fifty to sixty years after, oh. and they're still completely intact. Oh that shit God. does not rot. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. 
Hmm. Uh, any other? Oh, but that wasn't on the list. No, that no, uh, that was that was so good. I didn't even have it on my list. <laughs> What's next? I was going to say teak. Teak, obviously. Yeah. Yep, teak. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. Any okay. others? Redwood, I guess. The redwood. Yep. Redwood mm-hmm. is a solid. Um, I, I mean, either. outside of outside of importing like highly expensive exotics that don't rot because they're oak. half silical. White oak. Yeah, actually. white oak. Yeah. Okay. It's decent. Right, yeah. Decent. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fair. Okay. You know why I did that as a, as a trivia question? Because so many people ask me, I need to make ch- Adirondack chairs. Or I make flower boxes. What should I make it out? And of course, pressure if you're treated, making, obviously. If you're making those, just make them out of pine. It's going to fucking yep. degrade anyway. Pressure treated pine is good for, for things like that. But anyway, we, we I thought we'd review some of the other uh, woods that hold up outdoors. Second of all, the next question is, uh, speaking of outdoor woods, which oak has open pores and which has closed pores and when it has closed pores what exactly is closing them what which oak has open which and oak closed? has open pores which Red? oak has closed pores yeah. and no, what white, is white closing oak has them? open pores or, yeah, Wait, sorry. white is sorry. open red is closed yes eh. no it's the other way around right yeah yeah Red is red is open. It always has open grain, and then white is closed. I don't know what closes them, though. Mary is correct. No, she's not. Yes, she is. <laughs> Flat out denial. That's why. Um, that's why red. You don't use red oak for cutting boards or anything, and white oak is okay usually. I mean, Mary, here, here's here's Mary here's the thing. dropping the knowledge. Here's the thing. They're they're both open. <laughs> Yeah, Not... they're both open comparatively to some other <laughs> okay. woods, but white is more closed for sure. <laughs> One of them you can use as a straw and blow bubbles in your yeah. you in can, your you water. You can do with. that in white oak. I've done that. Nope. I will. Try it. I will get a piece of fucking white oak right now and do it, motherfucker. Try it Let's again. Let's chop up my guy. dining table. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, try it again, buddy. I've tried this, it both. I've tried it multiple soccer. times. You're Wait, so wrong. what closes the the green? So what closes the pores of white oak? The whiteness. Yep. It's super interesting, uh, and it's a su- science Southern answer. baptism. It's called. They're called. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Southern baptism. They're called tyloses, and it's actually an extrusion of the cell wall of the plant cell, like the the plant cell that makes the wood. Like think of it like a little uh, rectangle. It like has a bleb that like comes out of the side wall and like sticks into the pore and like clogs it shut. It's so cool. Remember science. when we said that Paul loves science? <laughs> We've been talking about woodworking for 67 minutes, and this motherfucker just lit up for the first time all episode <laughs> like a schoolboy who just saw a pair of boobies for the first time. <laughs> Eric! <laughs> So Google, not boobies, but tyloses. <laughs> and if you want to, and, and look at Google images and you'll see the cell wall of like kind of like extruding out into the pore and clogging it shut. I thought that was so absolutely fascinating as to why white oak is not only a good outdoor wood because it resists water because of that. Mary, very good. I give you extra credit. Eric, you were totally fucking wrong. <laughs> so stand by what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that's really interesting. Next question. Okay. Uh, uh, which mahogany relative smells like cinnamon and or nutmeg when you cut it? I don't know this one. Ooh, I can smell sassafras. You both know the answer. It's not sassafras. You said it already. Ife? Sapele? Sapele. Sapele. Yeah, oh, sapele. I never worked with sapele. I don't know I don't if you've know. ever cut sapele. No, it smells it smells like like cinnamon and nutmeg mixed together. It's a f- interesting. Fast. It's like such a good smell. I remember it smelling good, but I didn't I don't I don't know if I like pinpointed it as cinnamon well, and nutmeg. Well, mahogany smells huh. like nothing and sapele smells amazing. Are there any other woods that you guys I like, like the smell of? Sassafras. You just fucking smells, sassafras. Smells like Get Christmas. It. Huh? No, I'm dead ass, man. Are you serious? Sa- yeah, dead sassafras. Ass. Sassafras is fucking delightful. I thought you were dead ass. No cat, motherfucker. <laughs> what are you, fifteen? <laughs> said what I said. Oh man, no, sassafras is delightful. What's it smell like? Like juniper? 
Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, listen, I don't have a refined palate or nose, but it smells <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I it smells will like add Christmas. one. I want to add one to the list. Bloodwood. It smells amazing when what? you cut it. <laughs> okay. It smells so sweet and beautiful. Oh shit! I just undid one of my answers. Oh no! Oh, I just screwed up. No. <laughs> Can't control Z that motherfucker. Uh, I just uh, I just gave the answer to one of my next questions. What's the only red wood that doesn't <laughs> oxidize to brown over time? Wah, wah. I mean, bloodwood will go brown eventually. No, it doesn't. Not for a long, long, yeah. long, well, I mean, everything long goes brown time. eventually. I've Did never I seen mom? it, Eric. <laughs> I, I know, Eric, Eric, you know, if you, if yeah, you look it's it up. Fair. I, like, I have a couple of sticks that are still very red. So Paduk red yeah. turns brown immediately. Fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, red, red heart turns brown yep. fast. Yep. Bloodwood for some reason stays red almost it's forever. It's yeah. very ironic given how fast blood turns brown. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. All right. Next, next question. Uh, uh, what's the oldest tree on earth? Oh, Methuselah. Well, it is. Uh, it is Methuselah. He got it. Yeah. I was going to say, I remember Prometheus was the oldest tree and then got cut down and, then, and everything. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, actually, my friend who's a glass blower recently tracked down the stump of Prometheus because they, really? they have hit, hidden location. She did a 3D scan of it and she's glass blowing a mold of it. And it's <gasps> extremely oh, cool. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's, that's so cool, Mary. Was Prometheus yeah. a bristlecone pine like Methuselah? Yes. yes. Okay. I th- where where's Methuselah located? Okay, so Methuselah. Do they give the location? The, no, it's not like the, general just, location. No. Yeah, yeah, it's in the Inyo National Forest in the White Mountains of Eastern California. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, that's the that's similar. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if any of you have seen a picture of Methuselah. Oh yeah, the, yeah, the bristlecone pine. Gnarly as shit. They estimate it's age at 5,000 uh-huh. years old. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 5,000. Let's put that in perspective, right? That is like 3,000 BC is when that tree started growing. Is that older than the pyramids? I think yeah. that's older than the pyramids, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3,000 BC is when that pine tree like took root and yeah. sort of growth. Yeah. like what yeah and if you look at pictures of it it's a hot mess it's like it looks oh, yeah. dead <laughs> yeah it's all no twisted it looks and... five thousand years old yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's tiny it's like six feet tall it's barely really like... oh yeah oh, it's really? tiny i didn't realize yeah. it was that small. no the, the bristlecone oh, pines wow. are small they're all twisted and wow. gnarly they're small trees they're not big they're on they're on tops of mountains they're not they're no no they're not like these huge sequoias or anything it's Google only six it. feet yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's small. It's sm- I don't know if it's six feet exactly. It might be eight feet. I don't know. But it's but small. But it's not like it's the not... like redwoods no. or anything. No, no. Wow. It's on the top of I mountains. I don't understand how this is alive. <laughs> <laughs> like it just, it looks like a fossil. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question. What is the largest organism? And this has to do with a tree. What is the okay. largest the Aspens living in Colorado? Organ- Oh God, Eric! You're so fast, <laughs> Dick. The Aspen Grove. Yep, he's right. So the largest living organism, and it happens that the oldest living root system in the world is a stand of trembling aspen in Utah, and they oh, estimate it right. to be eighty thousand years old. That's now, so cool. Now, really? That's that's the root system has been yeah. alive for 80,000 years and it just keeps sending up like aspens mm-hmm. and it's 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 100 acres big. That's how big the root system is. It's 100 acres and it just keeps sending up these little aspens and and the aspens are like 100 130 years old, but relative to its root system they're all clones of each other, by the way, because they come right. from Right, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, they're all genetically clones. It's wild. Every aspen is, is the same. They're just these little offshoots of what is an 80,000-year-old root system. How That's, that's so bonkers. cool. It's it's that's amazing. Ah, 80,000-year-old? That's where science becomes cool. <laughs> it's wow. like my two favorite things, science and wood. 80,000 years yeah. old? Yeah. Wow, it's almost they as old have... as you. 
Oh my wow. god! Wow! <laughs> Damn! Oh, you Has know to what? Make it. Has oh to my make god! A joke. <laughs> oh my god, Mary! If you're lucky, someday you'll be as old as me. <laughs> on that note, true. <laughs> on that note, we will pivot away from trivia. Uh, <laughs> I do. Uh, I want to say uh, thanks to our uh, Patreon supporters. You both, uh, not only thank you for supporting us, but you gave us ideas for the after show. And so mm. today's after show, we're going to talk about where do you get your wood from? Because I get asked that all the time, and I think the answers might surprise you. So if you'd like to join uh, to hear the after show. Uh, just join Patreon for us and you'll get all the answers you like. I want to thank our last five patrons over the, since the last show. We have Will uh, Baumgartner. We have a, an old friend of mine who I used to work with, Thomas Lewis, who used the username Tom Ass. Thank you, Thomas. That was very... <laughs> That was, that was Classic very Thomas. That was very sophisticated of you. Uh, we have Ed Duncan. We have Jono uh, and and Catherine. So uh, Catherine Dodd. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks, you for France. joining us. I sh- uh, so um, with that, I, I I think we're gonna roll on to the after show and talk. Also, about wood. I want to say if. Uh, we would love more questions for the after show. So if you do, if you are a patron and you have any ideas or questions you want to ask us that you want us to answer, please ask. All right. So with that, we will catch you next episode. All peace. Bye. Y'all. Hey, Mary said goodbye and we didn't have to dog her, Eric. Oh man. We're growing as a pod. Oh, Mary, oh you're catching Aww. on. Bye. <laughs> I hate Bye. you both so much. <laughs>